Hey everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History, brought to you by Smoky Mountain Relic Room and American Digger Magazine. And we're, ah, we're out in the field. We're out at the Waco pit outside of Waco, Texas with our good buddy, Matt Harrell. Matt, thanks for having us out here, oh, dude. Oh, no worries, man, anytime. Now, Matt is a volunteer at the Texas Through Time Museum in Hillsboro, Texas. We've been down here in Waco filming a whole series about this museum and everything that they do. And this is one of the awesome places to find fossils in this area that they talk about. So tell us about what 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 do we have going on behind us? So all of the all of the gray shales that you see behind us are part of the Del Rio formation. Now the, okay. the Del Rio formation was laid down during the Cretaceous period, at the same time as the Grayson formation. But it was uh, it was cut off from ocean currents, so everything got a lot smaller. So how many millions of years ago are we talking? Uh, roughly about ninety to one hundred and twenty. Okay, so ninety to one hundred and twenty million years ago. Yeah, so middle Cretaceous. Middle Cretaceous. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And that's when this was laid down. So what what kind of environment was this? This was a, a shallow lagoon, really close to shore. You get uh, bark from mangrove trees okay. and carbonized wood, as well as sharks, fish, sea urchins, okay. all sorts of stuff. Now we were talking beforehand, and I really want to get this idea across to everybody out there watching so what what's what is so unique about this site is how how this this little lagoon formed can you go into the history of that so the the lagoon formed uh, as ocean or uh, water levels were dropping down and they were dropping down at a, a very slow rate but at one point this uh, this lagoon was cut off from the ocean currents so oxygen levels decreased and all of the animals in this environment were forced to get smaller to survive that's insane so what you've got is is you've got during the Cretaceous you had this huge inland sea that cut in through the middle of North America and as this seas moved up and down in elevation this lagoon back here got cut off from the rest of that ocean so you've got this big salt water patch you know that's cut off from the rest of all of the species that are in the ocean and you get this thing called on land for terrestrial animals they call it island dwarfism where you've got an isolated population on let's say something like an island that just due to the natural environments you know these species over the thousands of years get smaller and smaller and smaller and this is the exact same effect only in water and we've ne I've never heard of anything like that before so mm -hmm. you know you've got species that are in the oceans you know that would normally be you know like this big or however big but because they're in this isolated lagoon environment cut off from the rest of the sea they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller through time that is exactly. insane that is so cool mm -hmm. why, why 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 do you think that happens it, it is the oxygen levels okay. because uh, all of the all of the organisms you find in this kind of environment a lagoonal environment for the most part, other than say the marine reptiles, uh, they have gills, so they need higher oxygen levels within the water itself. And without a good uh, good current moving in and replenishing those oxygen levels, they they continuously decrease. Oh, whoa! Now you, you do also see an increase in the type of bacteria that causes causes piratization. Okay. So some organisms you find in this formation, they're completely piratized and you won't find them non-piratized, like oh. the ammonites or the gastropods. So piratization, you're, you're talking, so when we go out and we find this fossil, the fossil is covered in pyrite? It's been completely replaced with pyrite. Whoa! Um, so, that, so pyrite is the mineral that replaced the fossil, so it's a pyrite fossil. Exactly. No joke, dude, that is awesome. Yep, yep. So what is it in, in the soil that causes you know, pyrite to, to, to be the catalyst to form these fossils. Well, uh, in the case of pyritization, it's not just the content of the, the soil or the rocks. Uh, when these fossils were deposited, there was a bacteria that lived at the bottom of the ocean current and they like more still anaerobic environments that are low in oxygen levels. So these bacteria, they kind of ate away at the, the organisms and replaced them with uh, iron and sulfur essentially and and those compounds over millions of years combined form the pyrite and no they basically the pyrite basically fills the cavities left behind by these bacteria dude that's so cool man these are fool's gold fossils <laughs> yep that's awesome oh so okay so you brought some examples of mm -hmm. you know we were talking a little bit earlier about you know how things get smaller can you, can you grab oh, yeah, some of the yeah. stuff and let's let's show everybody how things get smaller with time because i mean there's what's wild about this is you know the, this is an example of you know evolution you know in action that you can see in the fossil record you know things that in one parts of the you know of the world these same species are much larger but in this isolated environment just get teeny tiny 
down to size. And I mean, that's incredible. So let's mm -hmm. show, show everybody what we got. So is this the kind of stuff that we're looking for here? Yep, yep, exactly. Uh, this is some of the vertebrate material we have here. We have some partial fish over on this side, okay. a, a pycnodont fish jaw. But the really interesting thing is the shark teeth. Okay. Right here we have a crotodus tooth. And here's a crotodus tooth from the eagle ford group. You can see the drastic difference in size. Okay, so the same species, just mm -hmm. this is out in the ocean, and this is stuck here in the lagoon. Exactly. That's exactly. nuts, dude. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. That's insane. <laughs> yep. So you've got the same thing, but it just it miniaturizes it because it's trapped in this environment. Ex exactly. Uh, That's too Sharks cool. and fish are a lot like reptiles in the sense that they can get extremely large if they're given enough space and enough food. Okay. In this case, it lacked food. Okay, so let's see what else we got here. So we also have some ammonites from here that, and uh, you can see the, the pyridization on a lot of these. And the pyrite out here, it is extremely unstable. So you won't ever see it gold looking. You'll see it rusty and whatnot. Okay. But we have, uh, these are some Mariella boskiensis heteromorph ammonites. And then here is a Mariella boskiensis from the what? Grayson Formation, which was laid down at the same time, but it was not cut off by the ocean currents. What? So this uh, this Mariella got to its full size, whereas these were dwarfed. So so our, that is insane. So exact same period of time. Exact you got same. these guys, exact same species. These guys are running around big, giant, everything. They got all kinds of oxygen mm -hmm. available to them. These guys are trapped in their, in this lagoon. They've got low levels of oxygen, but they're still reproducing and enough to live in there. Exactly. Getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That is nuts, dude. <laughs> That's so cool how that can happen. Mm -hmm. That is insane, man. All right. Oh, so. Yeah. Let's go out and let's try to find some stuff and we're gonna take you guys with us. So it's raining, it's drizzly, we're gonna get muddy, nasty, soaked, but that's part of chasing history. So let's go see if we can find some stuff. All right, sounds yeah. good, man. Ah. All right, yeah, let's go. <laughs> All right, we weren't like three seconds from just leaving you a second ago and Matt's already nailed a tooth. I mean, right next to where we were just filming. Dude, what, what have we got in the dirt? This so is nuts. Right down here, we have a Cretolamna appendiculata shark tooth. Oh, wow. Now, this is the most common shark tooth you'll find in the Del Rio and the Grayson, for that matter. Okay. Um, it was a small to medium-sized shark. It was not the apex predator. The uh, Crotodus and the Crotoxorhino would have filled that spot. Okay. But it was definitely something I wouldn't want to be bit by. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of species is it comparable to today? Um, I mean, they're they're pretty close to. Uh, uh, I mean, you're you're pretty much generic shark not a tiger shark the squalicorax would be closer to that not a great white but like a, a black tip tip reef shark okay, like reef stuff sharks. like yeah, that okay yeah. i got you kind of smaller that's nuts dude we only just got started and we're finding stuff so all right we're gonna bring you more all right so here's what we want to show you guys real quick is is this is the difference between layers and this is how we can identify what layer is what due to one of the reasons why is this is colorization matt what's going on here we got this gray stuff down here we got this tan stuff up here mm -hmm. why are we got two different soils so we're sitting on the contact between two completely different formations the okay. gray is the del rio formation which is what we're hunting today and the tan material is it's a uh, clay that washed down from the eagle ford uh, group that's higher up now sometimes between those two formations you do get the Buddha formation, but that's a hard lens and we don't have that here. That's not a big formation, is it? No, no, it, not in this area. When you get out west it gets hundreds of feet thick. I got you. This side of Texas it's really thin. Okay. So this is so <clears throat> so what was go, what what was life like in this going on here in the gray stuff and what was life like going on in the tan stuff? Was it different? It, it was environments? different environments. Okay. Yeah, the Del Rio, as we talked about earlier, was a shallow lagoonal environment that got cut off from ocean currents. Okay. The Eagle Ford was a little bit deeper. It, it, you could consider it uh, right by the continental shelf. Okay, so because we've got two different depths of marine life and, and ocean and stuff, we're going to get two different colorations of soil. Yeah. That's exactly. cool. Ah! All right, well, let's get down into this gray stuff and see what we can find. <laughs> All right, so Matt brought up something to our attention that was really fascinating because, you know, you get out here and you find this, you're looking around and there's all these shells all over the place. There are these white shells that just look like they're littered everywhere. We've got one right here. We've got one right here. We've got these shells all over the place. And I was asking Matt, hey, is these the, are these the fossils? And you were saying they're not. So what do we got mm -hmm. going on here? So these snails are recent, meaning that they, uh, they 
lived maybe a week ago, maybe a year ago. Really? So on land, we've got animals on land that have shell bodies within yeah. them. Really? Exactly, exactly. That, so, so just because you've got a shell doesn't mean it's in the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Okay, so, so, so these are the land stuff. What does the fossils look like? So the fossils, uh, a lot of them will have this tan color or even a gray color when, you're, when we're talking about the sea urchins. It just oh, depends wow. on what yeah. kind of fossil it is like and what right kind here. of... Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. So that blends right in with the dirt. Mm-hmm. And the, the sea urchin, uh, sea urchins blend in even better. They are literally literally that, that color. color. Okay. Yep. So there's a there's a <laughs> shot of the new ones and the old ones. So we just wanted to point this out to you guys, you know, in oh. case you were out there hunting around. What, what you got? Here we go. I just found a oh, pyrotized gastropod nice. there. Nice! So Look at that! Good examples of the different types of preservation in this formation. Right there! That's so cool! Do you think one one day these guys right here will be fossils? Uh, probably not because no. of the environment they're living in now. Uh, there's a lot of erosion, but nothing's really holding them in. I got you. Hey, look, there's a bullet. Hey, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. We ain't got nothing to worry about, find. Yeah. We ain't getting no, shot no, at no. here in Texas. The, the police come out and do training exercises okay. out here. Sure. So. That's what they say. We're just exercising. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We wanted to show you guys something when we were out here walking around, and this is something that Matt pointed out to us. You know, we've got these fossils. We found a nice little grouping of fossils right here. And we got some stuff going on here. What, Matt, tell us the importance of getting out here and collecting this stuff. Because I didn't know this stuff could be destroyed so easily. Mm -hmm. So with pyrotized fossils in general, but these in particular, the pyrite is uh, very unstable. So right. it breaks down with exposure to, uh, to moisture and oxygen very, very rapidly. So I, like this, uh, this little worn uh, ammonite section, it'll be turned to dust within maybe a week and a half of wow. sitting out here. But this freshly exposed gastropod, it might have a month. Really? Mm -hmm. That's cr so. That's why. And look and see. There's a shark tooth right there. It's got its back end missing. But you know, it's really important and imperative to get out and collect this stuff as soon as possible, Definitely. just because the natural environment is going to destroy it. Mm. So I mean, so when you're out here collecting this stuff, you're actually doing a service by saving these fossils by getting out and collecting them. Now, what is it in the pyrite that makes it? you know, dissolve or degrade? Well, pyrite is uh, composed of one iron molecule, okay. or one iron atom and two sulfur atoms. Okay. And when they react with water, uh, the water basically combines with the sulfur to create sulfuric acid. So oh. the sulfuric acid is actively eating these pyrite what? fossils. What? Mm -hmm. That is nuts! Yeah. So as soon as this stuff gets exposed and gets wet, it chemically creates an acid that Will eat it and destroy it and turn it into dirt. Exactly. That's so cool. I mean, it's it's cool, but that sucks. But that's cool. It is with it. Oh yeah, chemistry is awesome. God, that's <laughs> nuts, man. So it's important to get out and collect this stuff. Dude, we're walking along and you, I heard that. Oh yes, this is what we come here for, dude. What do we got going on, man? So right down here, I was walking by and I spotted these three associated fish vertebrae. Wow. And dude. Uh, associated fossils in general are hard to come by. And uh, associated just means they probably all three came from the same fish. Wow, that is nuts. We know what species it is? Uh, hard to say based off the vert. I mean, we, we can tell shark versus fish off the verts. And some species of fish, we can identify the species. But uh, this one, uh, not so much. How rare is this out here? You find the verts pretty pretty frequently but finding multiple that are that are from the same individual yeah extremely rare dude that's awesome man <laughs> ah! all right well, we're wrapping up our hunt out here at the Waco pit outside of Waco Texas and we found all kinds of awesome stuff so Matt let's let's walk up here and let's let's see what let's let's show everybody what we what we got going on here in my hand so what all have we found here so you have a uh, there's a scallop uh, you have a really nice Mantellocerus brazoens right there. Uh, that would be a little gastropod or snail. It's another kind of ammonite. I can't ever remember that the name of that taxa though. You do okay. have a couple Mariellas, the okay. heteromorph ammonites, which is really cool because heteromorphs worldwide 
are rare, but here wow. you can find a pretty good amount That's of them. That's cool. So, and then you even have a little sea urchin spine there and your nice. shark tooth from earlier. Now what's this? Is that just happen to be shaped like a something or? That is a uh, gastropod. Okay. Yep, yeah, yeah. but nice. that one would have come from the quaternary alluvial deposits. Okay, so this is younger? A lot younger. Lot We're younger. talking ice age or Oh, younger. and just but, happened to wash in. Yeah, but nice. it is a Cretaceous taxa that washed into the gravel deposits and then we find okay. it redeposited a, a third time. Now I found this here. This looks like what we were talking about earlier, how you've got one that's pyrotized, it's exploding and just breaking apart. So Exactly. And so that's going to happen to these if we don't take care of them. So what that's do we right. need to do to take care of these things? So to care for uh, pyrotized fossils, it can be a little complex. Okay. Uh, you want to soak them in, in rubbing alcohol or denatured alcohol even for about 24 hours. And then you coat them with a glue uh, polyvinyl acetate, paraloid, or butvar are usually my go-tos, and that'll that won't stop the process, but it'll slow it down. Okay. Ultimately, controlling the temperature and humidity is the best way. Okay. And see, if we didn't come out here and we didn't collect this stuff, this stuff would be destroyed. Now, here at the Waco site, they've got, you know, you've got to get a permit to come out here and hunt, so mm -hmm. make sure you do that. Make sure you follow the rules out here. One of the rules that's out here is, is you're only allowed to keep two specimens per permit, which means per person. So what we're gonna do is before we leave, we're gonna go through our bag, look through it, pick out the two best ones that we wanna keep. I'm probably gonna keep the shark tooth and one of those ammonites, <laughs> and we'll leave the rest of them out here, you know, uh, to unfortunately be destroyed. Because yeah. that's what's gonna happen to the stuff that we found. And that's kind of a shame when you think about it. You know, we make the trouble to come out here and find this stuff, but, mm -hmm. and collect it, but no matter what, it's gonna be destroyed. I mean, I understand, you know, wanting to make sure that everybody's gonna get a chance to find stuff. Yeah. But, you know, how big is this expanse? Um, this formation extends for hundreds of miles. Okay, so there's a lot of fossils. There is. There's, there really uh, is. And see, that's part of the greater part that we're trying to get out across to you guys, is that fossils aren't rare. They're everywhere. You just got to know where to hunt. And this is one of the places that you can go and hunt out at the Waco Pick. Just, what are we, west of Waco, Texas? Uh, north. North of Waco, right by Texas. by the airport. Nice, man. Nice. Matt, thank you so much My for pleasure, coming out man. here and showing us this, dude. Anytime. We've got, we've got some more adventures coming up with the team from the Texas Through Time Museum. So, Matt, dude, this, ah, this is awesome, man. Be sure to uh, like and subscribe our videos. We're going to go get dry and cleaned up, and we're going to go chase some more history. So, history rocks! Woohoo! Woo!